Welcome to everyone joining. Uh, we're going to wait a few seconds while Zoom uh, opens up the waiting room and allows uh, our nearly 200 registrants to join. So let's just give that a few moments. Okay, great. Let's go ahead and uh, kick this off. Uh, hello, everyone, uh, and welcome to the uh, nearly 200 individuals who've registered to participate in today's expert roundtable on transformation in Sri Lanka, opportunities for transitional justice. My name is Paul Williams, and I'm a professor of law at American University and the founder of the Public International Law and Policy Group, and I will be moderating today's discussion. I'm an honored to be guiding the conversation with my colleagues. As many of you know, the Public International Law and Policy Group is a global pro bono law firm, which provides free legal assistance to parties involved in peace negotiations, drafting post-conflict constitutions, and prosecuting those responsible for atrocity crimes. This event is part of the PILPG Thought Leadership Initiative. This initiative focuses on a range of topics from prominent international law issues to pressing global conflicts. Through organizing periodic roundtables, our aim is to share expertise and reflections from our work around the globe. Today, we will discuss the recent political and economic crisis in Sri Lanka and the role that transitional justice may play in putting the country on the path to durable economic transformation and democratic transformation. Our panelists will provide expert commentary and background to Sri Lanka's civil war and recent crises. They will explore options for accountability within the current context and discuss the role of transitional justice in Sri Lanka's pursuit of durable peace and democracy. The roundtable will be 60 minutes long. Our esteemed panelists include Ambika Sakunanathan, Jehan Pereira, Mario Gomez, Miriam Young, and Alan Keenan. We ask that you submit any questions you have for our speakers using the Q&A function, and we will do our best to answer your questions throughout the event, either in person or typing up answers into the Q&A. Now, let me introduce our panelists. Today, we are honored to welcome Ambika Sakunathan, a human rights advocate with more than 20 years experience working with communities, and community organizations impacted by human rights violations. From 2015 to 2020, she was a commissioner of the Human Rights Commission of Sri Lanka. Now, prior to that, she was a legal advisor to the UN Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights for eight years. She is a member of the expert panel of the Trial Watch Project of the Clooney Foundation and also a member of the network of experts of the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime. We are also excited to welcome Mario Gomez, who is the Executive Director at the International Center for Ethnic Studies, an independent think tank in Sri Lanka, and an adjunct senior research fellow at the Center for Asian Legal Studies at the National University of Singapore. He has worked in academia, human rights, and peace building and previously taught constitutional law, administrative law, and legal theory at the University of Colombo. He was also a postdoctoral Fulbright Scholar at the Kennedy School of Government. We are also very pleased to have with us Jehan Pereira. Jehan is a founding member and presently executive director of the National Peace Council of Sri Lanka, which works with networks of partner NGOs and interreligious groups throughout Sri Lanka. The council focuses on building public support for a political solution to the ethnic conflict and on supporting inter-ethnic and inter-religious conflict mitigation through community cohesion. He writes a regular and widely read weekly political column for the national media that focuses on the peace building and reconciliation processes in Sri Lanka. I'm also very excited 
to welcome Alan Keenan, a senior consultant on Sri Lanka at the International Crisis Group and a visiting fellow in the London School of Economics Center for Women, Peace and Security. He has been leading the International Crisis Group's research and advocacy on Sri Lanka since 2007. His academic research has focused on the politics of human rights advocacy and the complicated relationship between Sri Lankan civil society activism and international institutions. Before joining the crisis group, he taught at Bryn Mawr College, Harvard College, and the universities of California, Berkeley, and Santa Cruz. And as an alum of UC Davis, that particularly warms my heart. And we are also excited to uh, welcome Miriam Young. Miriam has worked for two and a half decades on peace and conflict resolution in Sri Lanka. She was a co-founder of the US NGO Forum on Sri Lanka and a nonpartisan network of organizations for working for peace, human rights, and development in Sri Lanka. Ms. Young is currently executive director to the forum's successor, the US Council on Sri Lanka, and serves as the US director of the International Working Group on Sri Lanka. You can view the full panelist biographies on the PILPG website, which is also being posted in the chat. Welcome everyone, and thank you for agreeing to participate in today's panel. Let's begin the conversation with Ambika. Can you briefly provide us some background about the recent developments in Sri Lanka for our audience members? What factors brought us to this current point in time and the need to have this conversation about transitional justice? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Paul. Um, I think the need to have the conversation about transitional justice has existed for a long time. And many of the root causes of the crisis that we face now can also be traced to and linked to the ethnic conflict. Because uh, I've, I've noted that the crisis now is termed as an economic crisis. It is, but the reasons for it are political, long-term historical, political dysfunctionality, systemic and structural problems, the nature of the Sri Lankan state, which, you know, Sinhala Buddhist ethnocratic state. And that is also uh, one of the main you know, root causes of the ethnic conflict. And also the reason why after the end of the war in 2009, we have not been able to find uh, solutions and transitional justice initiatives have stalled. So the current conflict is a uh, current crisis, economic crisis due to political reasons, and that has had a socio-political uh, and economic impact. So it's, all, it's a humanitarian crisis also with human rights uh, repercussions. We have seen everything from growing malnutrition to people losing their livelihoods, impact on education, as well as police brutality use of the state of emergency. Now, the state of emergency is something that was used historically, particularly to deal with the internal armed conflict. So as you can see, the root causes of the current crisis are also root causes of the ethnic conflict. And of course, the all powerful executive president who is who cannot be held accountable once again, linked to the ethnic conflict. So that is how the current crisis is linked to the ethnic conflict, to the uh, to transitional justice, and why we need to keep having that conversation. Thank you, Ambika. Let me now turn to first Mario and then Jehan to add any additional thoughts or commentary on to how we got here uh, and the role of uh, transitional justice in a durable and democratic future Sri Lanka. Thank you, Paul, and um, thank you for having us on this program. I think we need to uh, celebrate uh, the struggle that has gone on for at least six months in Sri Lanka. It's been unprecedented. It resulted in the resignation of a president who many thought was uh, authoritarian, but also was not governing the country in the way he should be. Uh, so even though the transition from the struggle to a post-transitional post phase um, hasn't quite played out in the way that some of us might have wanted it to, uh, I think we have to celebrate what was uh, initially uh, a very peaceful and democratic struggle uh, waged against an authoritarian regime. 
I just want to flag two points here uh, before I pass on to Trayan. One is, I think, uh, this whole political, economic, and humanitarian crisis um, illustrates the failure of presidentialism, uh, the executive presidency in Sri Lanka, as a form of government uh, for, for the country. In 1978, when Jayawardena first uh, introduced presidentialism, uh, he said it would uh, usher in political stability and therefore spur economic growth and uh, move Sri Lanka along the road of some of the Asian tigers. Uh, but what we've seen really in 44 years has been uh, enormous periods of political instability. We've seen ethnic riots against the Tamils in 1983, in 1977. Uh, we've seen ethnic violence and religious violence against the Muslims since 2009. And uh, we've seen the JBP insurrection uh, in uh, 1989, again, where hundreds of thousands were, were sort of killed and, uh, and disappeared. So while we were promised political stability, what we've gone through is enormous instability. And I think uh, this illustrates uh, the failure of presidentialism as a form of government in Sri Lanka. I think the second point that the political and economic crisis illustrates is um, the failure of a singular Buddhist majoritarianism um, as a um, ideology or as a political platform. Um, because what people have reacted against is uh, against the Rajapaksas um, and their stand uh, on singular Buddhist majoritarianism. So as many of you perhaps on this, on this conversation would know, uh, the Rajapaksas used uh, ethnic divisions. Uh, they used singular Buddhist nationalism as a force, as a form of mobilization. And I think this protest and this struggle over the last six months uh, clearly is a, uh, is a reaction against singular Buddhist majoritarianism. Uh, so I would hope that uh, perhaps, you know, in a post protest phase, uh, we might be able to address questions of interreligious healing, uh, interreligious reconciliation. Uh, inter-ethnic coexistence. Uh, and of course, the very divisive issue of power sharing, uh, which has been a sort of constant demand of, of, of the Tamil minority. Thank you, Mario. Let's turn it to Jehan for some additional thoughts. Jehan, you're still on mute. You're brilliant, but you're on mute. <laughs> Sorry. I have changed that. Um, yeah, what I was saying is that two, two thoughts. And the, the first is about the protest movement. The, the main slogan of the protest movement has been that the government should go. That is the main one. The president should go, which has happened. And the second thing that they have been talking about is system change. Now, when they think, when they talk of system change and why they want the president to go and the entire parliament, in fact, to go, is because of the what they see as the corruption, the corruption that wrecked our economy. The, the literal the belief that, that the shortage of dollars, which is responsible for huge uh, lines in front of petrol stations and uh, shortages of food, has been caused by the actual physical robbery of, of the dollars by the, by the ruling uh, people. Uh, so, so it's corruption that they, that they really see as being uh, needing to be taken care of uh, through system change. In that sense, uh, I mean, the, the issue of the other issues such as uh, uh, power sharing, those have not been really emphasized so much in, at all in, in, in the struggle. And uh, although, although the issue of power sharing, which led to war, I mean, the war uh, which lasted three decades and ate up so much of our resources and led us to borrow from the world to sustain the war effort as well as to sustain our, our standard of living uh, is responsible, largely responsible for, for the plight we are in. The, the second point I would like to make is that uh, the dilemma that we are facing right now, that we, are, we have changed, our president has gone, our prime minister has gone, the one who were there at the beginning, and they have been replaced by a new president and a new prime minister, but elected not by the people but by a parliament that has lost its legitimacy because the fact that a protest people's protest 
force the resignation of the president and the prime minister and force the resignation of the entire cabinet of ministers about two months ago, but the par par parliament remains and the parliament is dominated by the ruling party. And they are the ones who then elected the new president and he appointed the new prime minister. So the question, and, but they say, this is all within the law. This is the law, this is the constitution. We are protecting the constitution by doing all this, but the legitimacy is gone. So law and legitimacy. Now that is the dilemma. That's what we have to tackle now. Thank you, Jehan. Uh, let me now turn first to Miriam and then to Alan to enlighten us about the international dimension of this situation. What is it that the international community did that prompted this, this economic crisis? What are the strategic interests of the international community and what can the international community do, if anything, to facilitate uh, uh, Sri Lanka's uh, embracing of transitional justice and mm -hmm. its path? to a durable democratic transformation. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I, I want to start just by, um, again, emphasizing that for this movement, this people's movement to have taken shape and to have become so powerful, um, despite the huge mandate that <clears throat> Waltabaya Rajapaksa and his ruling party um, had, I, I think it really speaks to just how catastrophically um, the government messed up and, and just what a huge problem um, uh, Sri Lanka is facing. Um, the, the international community has looked on with uh, concern and alarm, but I think also with caution. They are not going to throw money at the government without some guarantee that it will be managed properly. I do think that in general, they recognize that the causes are not just economic, but also deeply political. So India has been really the most generous so far in giving assistance uh, to the government. And they've said that they will consider more uh, once there is an IMF agreement. The US um, just uh, announced they were giving 20 million in humanitarian aid and there was a recent delegation from the US Treasury, I believe, and they have announced additional assistance. But the World Bank um, made a polite statement um, saying, sorry, um, other than rearranging some of our resources, we just really can't help you with more financing right now until you address the root causes of this crisis. So the big hope, is on the IMF, um, uh, uh, achieving an IMF agreement. And this is being negotiated. Um, but again, the IMF wants to see serious structural reforms and to be presented with a serious plan. And so somehow this government um, has to figure out how to get buy-in from a still very angry citizenry that is going to have to agree to suffer more um, and, and endure more scarcity before things improve on the ground. Um, and I, I want to just um, perhaps, I think Jahan has really pointed it out well that this government, while it has been elected through constitutional process and can, is seen, I think, by most donors as legitimate. <coughs> It, it does not have a mandate from the people. Um, and I think it's important for the international community, for those who want to help Sri Lanka, that they understand this. Um, so in a sense, Ronald is in position because of this people's movement, but he holds it now because of the ruling party, which wants to preserve the power of the ruling elite and the power of the Rajapaksas. Um, so one of the big calls of the movement was no more deal politics, no more deal making. And in a sense, that kind of corruption within the elite class is what they were fighting against and that has not uh, changed. Alan can fill in all my gaps. <laughs> 
I can, yeah, can I'll you hear me? You. Yep, over to you, Alan, okay. I can hear you perfectly. Yeah, well, there's not, not too many gaps, uh, Miriam. Uh, actually, you uh, you went through most of what I was gonna say. Um, just let me fill in, you didn't mention China, which, um, which is interesting because that's what most people mention uh, globally. You know, there's this whole kind of China, China caused the problem narrative, um, which is grossly oversimplified. Uh, China certainly gave a lot of money uh, for big infrastructure projects and loaned a considerable amount of money <clears throat> to become Sri Lanka's largest international uh, donor over the last decade, roughly speaking, getting ahead of Japan, which had previously had held that position. Um, <clears throat> but if you look at the percentages of, of Sri Lanka's foreign debt, uh, the estimates are that China is somewhere in the 10 to 15% range. Um, so they're not the main, the main uh, creditor or the main cause of um, Sri Lanka's uh, debt crisis. In fact, the more significant cause are um, Sovereign bondholders, including a lot of um, American bondholders, big um, hedge funds, and other large groups of, of investors, uh, they are actually the biggest. I think some roughly fifty percent of the debt is somewhere in that range, is held by that set of creditors. Um, but China has played an important role in sustaining uh, the Sri Lankan government over the last fifteen years or so, particularly Roger Pax's both in international forum like the uh, UN Security Council at the very last months of the war where China and Russia blocked any action by the Security Council and um, in other forum. And they've given significant political support to the Rajapaksas within Sri Lanka. So I think there, there's, if we're talking sort of contributions to the crisis, China's political support has been as important or more important than its direct kind of contribution to the debt crisis. Um, uh, what we also haven't mentioned, what you didn't mention, Miriam, uh, would be the uh, the other main sort of international forum for dealing with Sri Lanka over the last um, 15 years or so has been the UN Human Rights Council, which um, had a series of sort of increasingly strong resolutions from in 2012, 13, and 14, when the Roger Poxes were in power. And then in 2015, passed a landmark resolution, or what people hoped would be a landmark resolution, which was co-sponsored by the government, the national unity government of the time, uh, which was headed by um, then President Maitri Pala Sirisena and then Prime Minister Ranil Vikramasinghe, who's now back as president. Um, so they co-sponsored a resolution which included a very ambitious set of transitional justice mechanisms, a hybrid court, a truth commission, Office of Reparations, Office of uh, Missing Persons, and a series of other promises to, to address the legacy of the war and the legacy of militarized governance and the legacy of, of sort of unequal power uh, that had dogged Sri Lanka for many years. But unfortunately, those promises didn't end up really uh, delivering much and left a, a sort of a bitter taste in a lot of people's mouths uh, by the time the Rajapaksas came back in in 2019. Uh, so in 2021, there was a, a further resolution by the council, quite critical of the government of then President Gotabi Rajapaksa. And probably its most important uh, initiative or additional element um, that is relevant to this discussion was the establishment of an accountability mechanism within OHCHR, within the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, which is tasked with gathering um, evidence, uh, collecting evidence, and pulling that evidence together in ways which could be used for possible prosecutions or other um, transitional justice and accountability mechanisms globally. Um, and that uh, unfortunately did not get full funding by the UN, but has just, and it took a while to get up and running, but it is, it is operative now. And um, when the uh, Human Rights Council meets in September, one of the uh, most important things for it to do is to continue the mandate of this accountability project, uh, which I think could be one possible vehicle to continue the quest for justice um, else, both in Sri Lanka and outside. Great, thank you, Miriam uh, and Alan for that additional context. Um, and in particular, helping us get our heads around the, uh, the financial structure and the lending, which has led to this, as well as the political support from China. Uh, and others. Um, let's now turn uh, back to Ambika. And you know, during the uh, during and after the Civil War, there were extensive efforts to document the atrocity crimes, the human rights violations that occurred during the Civil War, uh, in particular against the, the Tamil population and other populations. Uh, there's also been substantial human rights violations more recently. 
Uh, can you share your thoughts on whether those documentation efforts relating to the Civil War were sufficient and, and form a basis for transitional justice? And is there something uh, unique about the more recent human rights violations and how might that impact the, uh, the need and the path for transitional justice? Uh, we have to view human rights violations on a continuum. Uh, and document as far as documentation is concerned, we've even had uh, presidential commissions on disappearances, both in the North as well as in the South. We've had an all-island disappearance commission, and they've also documented extensively. They put forward quite progressive recommendations. We've had many reports since then, including the UN's OISL report, the UN Secretary General's panel of experts. Uh, so the lack of action is due to lack of political will. The lack of action is not due to a lack of data, not a lack of information. Uh, and of course, um, uh, during Yaha Parliament, there were attempts uh, to do that, uh, establishing the Office on Missing Persons, and they were drafting uh, laws for also a Truth Commission, etc. Uh, but I think even then, uh, there was a fear and reluctance and, of course, coalition politics, the conflict between the president and the prime minister. But always what we found is that in successive governments, the fear of the South, the fear of the Buddhist clergy, the fear that we might be giving too much to the minorities, which once again comes back to the nature of the state, the values upon which it is founded. And those once again, linking, linking back to the current conflict, one of the reasons that Gotabe Rajapaksa was able to win was because of that. The two pillars of his ideology, as I keep saying, are Sinhala Buddhist nationalism and militarization. And he won on the platform of the fact that he won the war and by um, uh, propagating you know, racism, communalism against Muslims, et cetera. So we come back again to the nature of the state and any transitional justice initiative will have to grapple with the nature of the state. And for that, I think we also need to uh, do a lot of work in the South in terms of changing mindsets. And the, the Aragale or the protest movement has opened the door or the window a little bit. And that space is there, but in, a more, lot more work needs to be done in the South rather than in the North and the East. And it's only by changing the mindsets of the population in the South that um, you know, there can be any solution, for instance, to the ethnic conflict. But of course, where the accountability is concerned right now, the domestic mechanisms are not uh, independent. And uh, even if you take you know, prosecution, et cetera, investigations, all that. Therefore, right now, local national accountability, you know, what are the uh, prospects for it? I would say practically none. Thank you, Ambika. Um, let's now turn to, to Mario and, and, and picking up on uh, Ambika's observations relating to you know, the dim prospects or the zero prospects for, for local accountability um, and Alan's introduction into the conversation <clears throat> of the work of the UN Human Rights Council. Um, what, what, what do you assess as, as the likelihood of uh, the Human Rights Council's uh, mechanisms for accountability being implemented and, and what needs to be done in order to facilitate uh, the work of the Human Rights Council and the Office of the High Commissioner for, uh, for Human Rights? One of the first acts of the uh, Rajapaksa government was to withdraw from the Human Rights Council resolution. Um, my feeling is that Vikramasinghe, his uh, position as president is fairly secure for the next two years. Uh, and my inkling is that he possibly may want to build a constituency uh, among the Tamils in the North and may take some tentative steps towards trying to re-engage with, with the Human Rights Council. Now I say that although I know he is dependent on, uh, on the support of the Rajapaksa party, the SLPP, uh, for parliamentary support uh, to pass legislation. But uh, having said that, I think his position constitutionally is reasonably secure. I don't, I don't see the possibility of an impeachment in the next two years. And so uh, I just have a sense that he may tend to strike out on his own, um, try to build an independent foreign policy uh, that is more, more his liking uh, rather than the Rajapaksa's liking. Uh, 
he's also called out for uh, an all party uh, an all party government a sort of national government uh, and we don't know really how that might play out but if that was to occur and if you have the uh, main opposition party uh, come into a, a sort of all party government uh, perhaps that might provide a little more leeway uh, for being able to engage uh, with with the human rights council and also uh, a foreign policy that's uh, that's more engaging uh, with with the uh, with the international community i mean i think something that uh, vikram singham might really want to focus on going forward is um, the European Union's uh, sort of condition for, for a continuation of the GSP plus trade concessions, which is, um, which is an amendment or, or changing the legislation on national security, the, the sort of PTA, which, which has been used in, in different ways, uh, both to harass uh, uh, Sikhalese and Tamils and, and also Muslims. So um, my instinct is that um, uh, Vikram Singh may want to cultivate a constituency within the Tamil community and that might kind of impel him, uh, therefore, to engage with, with the Human Rights Council. Mario, let me ask you a, a follow-up question, which has been posted in the, the Q&A uh, from one of our audience members about the legitimacy of, of Renil wicker uh, And then, Jehan, you're, you're next in my queue for, for, for uh, speaking, so I'm going to ask you that, that same question as well. Uh, you noted that probably a two year and that he has mandate, my words, not yours, a mandate to make some of these changes. Doesn't he still suffer a degree of illegitimacy given that he is part of the political elite? I think we've lost count, but this is his fifth time being president or, or, or prime minister. Has, has this been a, a brief spurt of street activism? And now it's sort of a more moderate version of the old regime, or we're gonna see this pressure continue to build and, and challenge his, his legitimacy. So I'll, I'll be curious for your thoughts. And then Jehan, I'm gonna ask you the same question because you raised and hinted at this in your first intervention. Mario? There was an enormous amount of public anger when um, Vikram Singh took over as prime minister in May, because many of those involved in the protest and many of us in civil society uh, thought we were on the cusp of actually getting rid of Rajapaksa in May. And then Vikram Singh took over and kind of provided a lifeline to, to the Rajapaksa regime for a couple of months. So in terms of public support, uh, public legitimacy, he, he has almost, almost none, I would say, apart from some support within uh, certain sections of, of the urban elite and perhaps the business, uh, business elite. So he, he was elected, he was seen as probably the safest uh, option uh, to the Rajapaksas and basically elected by the Rajapaksa party uh, because they still have a substantial majority uh, in parliament. But I think as Jehan or one of the others uh, said earlier, uh, none of the political institutions really have any public legitimacy. And I, I think the whole struggle was really against all of these institutions, the executive presidency, parliament. And one of the reasons we really had this spontaneous uprising, uh, I think was because there was no political leader around whom any dissent could mobilize. Everyone had lost legitimacy, everyone in parliament, uh, everyone in government. And therefore that, that kind of gave rise, that catalyzed uh, this spontaneous organic um, protest movement, which was uh, which was unprecedented uh, in uh, in Sri Lanka. So to me, I think uh, Vikrama Singh has no has no sort of uh, public legitimacy. Um, how he will how he will manage this uh, is is left to be seen. He's, he's obviously reaching out uh, to other political parties to see whether he can form a sort of all party alliance uh, that would govern for the next two years. But to me, I would say one priority would be uh, to try and call an election as, as, as soon as possible. Um, this is, I mean, it's not possible for the president to dissolve parliament until I think around March 2023, uh, unless of course parliament requests a dissolution of, of parliament. <laughs> uh, so I would say a, a sort of early election is, uh, should, be, should be a priority. And I would say a, a referendum on the abolishment of the executive presidency should also be a priority. Right. Thanks, Mario. Uh, Jehan, let me turn and have you address that same question of, of the legitimacy. But if you could also, in addition, add the perspective of 
of youth. Uh, you work very closely with youth on questions of transitional justice and political reform. So if you could initially share your, your own views, but then also reflect, um, although we're all young at heart, um, <laughs> if you could reflect a little bit of uh, what you're hearing from, from the youth activists that you work with in terms of how they see this arc of political and democratic transformation playing out. During his periods, uh... Uh, when he was prime minister previously, though he had presidents above him, uh, Ranil Vikramasinghe did try hard to address the ethnic issue, the ethnic conflict. When he was prime minister during the time of the LTTE, he tried, he entered into a ceasefire agreement with them, with them, which was quite remarkable, which caught us all by surprise. And uh, then in his last uh, period as prime minister, uh, 2015 to 2019, he tried again hard to come up with a new constitution. And uh, he's the one who uh, entered into a sort of a dialogue with the UN Human Rights Council, where the, whereas the previous, the Rajapaksa government had refused to engage constructively with it. He not only engaged with the Human Rights Council, he also co-sponsored a resolution uh, so those are very positive features in uh, Ranil Vikramasinghe. And so when Mario was saying that he will, uh, that one of his strategies might be to reach out to the Tamil, Tamil people to build his political base, it, it, is, it sort of corresponds with what he has been in the past. But the problem that Ranil Vikramasinghe has always had is a problem of, uh, he's been unable to sell it sell those values or those ideals or the, that type of strategy that, to the Sinhala people. They just don't, they just don't trust him. And now that problem will be compounded by the way in which he became president, you know, being voted in by the Rajapaksas, being seen as an agent of the Rajapaksas. And in fact, his initial actions have been quite uh, astonishing. I mean, in the, in the sense of being so reactionary, the first thing he did as president now he's armed with the powers of the presidency, he unleashes the military and the police and apparently some paramilitaries also on, the, on these hapless uh, protesters. You know, very few of them were staying uh, in the protest site and in the middle of the night, these, they were attacked in a most brutal way and chased off. I mean, it was, so uh, now, and now he has, uh, again, he has arrested the, the form, our foremost trade unions unionist as a teacher the teachers union that man has been arrested it has, it's outraging people so we are we are really a bit confused about what ranil vikramasinghe is up to but uh, yeah so so the the situation is bleak in terms of uh, transitional justice at this time because here a, a man who can't sell uh, things to the majority to the ethnic majority and then who has now suffering from a legitimacy crisis uh, is at the helm um, but uh, in terms of tra transitional, just in terms of taking the message to people, actually, it was during his period, his last period, when he reached out to the UN Human Rights Council, when he agreed to a to a to, to a framework of reconciliation, which involved what we normally call transitional justice, truth seeking, and uh, accountability. I mean, not accountability, but at least uh, reparations and uh, and uh, institutional reform. Uh, we, uh, my organization, went into the universities, the state universities, and talked about the issues of transgender justice. And we found that the young people, the young students, were very interested in it. They were very interested. Of course, they were interested in the theory of it, the theory of the four pillars of transgender justice, truth, accountability, reparations, institutional reform. That was something that they were interested in. They liked to hear about what other countries had gone through. And they didn't appear to be particularly uh, sort of nationalist in, in their outlook, which we also see in the, in the youth-led protesters. And one of the things that made me very happy when, when, I, when I went uh, in those, some of those protests was to hear them shout, uh, we are Sinhalese Tamil Muslim, we will not be divided on the basis of ethnicity, we are all equal. We know the politicians have used us in the past, we are not going to fall for that again. So they did take that position. And I think that they, that younger generation is more liberal than the older generation. But however, I, I mean, if you go a little deeper, that the old divisions will remain. I mean, if we talk about, say, self-determination for the Tamils in the North and East, 
if you talk of police powers for the for the provincial councils in the north and east, if you talk of land powers for the provincial council, then then I think the Sinhalese people will, even the youth, will get a little concerned, worried. That is, does it mean the country is going to break up? So there's a need. There's a need for education, for for talking about this, for dialogue, uh, for uh, platforms to bring people together, which we try to do on a, on a micro scale. It's not being done on a macro scale, uh, and and build and taking this process forward. But I, I I think that there is there is scope at this time, in particular, because people are looking for solutions. We they all we all know that something has gone terribly wrong in our country. Mm -hmm. So they are they are very interested. People are very interested at all levels, not just the youth, even public servants, all the people, all. Are interested. We are we are searching for answers. So this is actually a good time for uh, education projects, for activities that bring people together. Thank you, Jay Helen. Um, let's now turn to Miriam for the, the a question again on the international uh, dimension and what the international community can do. We we uh, discussed a bit the the Human Rights Council. Um, are there other international mechanisms that could play a role uh, in prompting accountability, transitional justice? Uh, one of our one of our guests in the Q and A just asked whether the International Association of Anti Corruption Authorities uh, might play a role. Um, if you want to give a pass on that, Mario has already tagged <laughs> that he'd like to answer that particular one. Um, and what do we make of the, the prospects uh, or the need for international engagement, given that some commentators have uh, alleged that uh, Renil Wakaramasingham uh, was associated with some of the violence of the Marxist and JVP uprisings in the, in the 70s and 80s, and, and that may chill his interest in a broader level of uh, accountability and transitional justice, even for the most recent uh, activities. So what can the international community do to help if it's invited in to provide assistance? Yes, yeah, so um, I was going to talk about the um, involvement of the UN, but I think um, some of the others have already discussed um, its involvement and the number of reports that have come out and uh, <clears throat> the different resolutions than the one that is currently um, in process. One of the reasons for that um, has been that there simply was no space or will within the country to pursue any process of um, accountability or justice. And so the UN just kind of became the main venue for that. Um, and um, the successive governments have done their best to kind of push back, uh, obfuscate, uh, create their own uh, processes to, to sort of claim we, we don't need the UN. Um, how much this all this activity actually has been able to change the situation on the ground, I think is a bit questionable. Um, you know, uh, Jahan is, has uh, made it, you know, very clear how important it is that these things happen in country. This is the only way something will actually um, kind of stick within a society to heal. Um, but what I think it has done and continues to do perhaps is to serve as a kind of a, like a check or a monitoring mechanism from outside. So that if nothing else, it, it might prevent things from getting worse. I think it, um, it allows uh, those people working within the country, with, within civil society, um, and those few figures perhaps in government that um, are committed to this, it, it also gives them support. So I think maybe that's where the, where the value of it is. Um, there's, there's been a kind of increasing focus on um, some other avenues for justice and accountability outside of the UN system. Uh, for example, the use of universal jurisdiction, uh, the use of travel and visa bans. Um, and the UN has been promoting that. Uh, so the US has made use of the travel ban already in just a few cases. They have most likely also um, 
used visa bans, although those are not things that we would hear about publicly. Um, but these kinds of efforts at least make it so that the main perpetrators don't have a sense that they can kind of come and go freely. Um, what I would say also <clears throat> to the international community that wants to assist Sri Lanka in this particular crisis is that they, to the extent possible, that they, um, they structure that assistance not in a sense of sequencing. You know, this idea that we must first address the humanitarian crisis, then we'll be able to address the economic crisis, and then only we'll deal with sort of the political human rights uh, history. I think that's been perhaps a mistake in the past, and, and that's already been pointed out. So if there is a way in which these things can be addressed simultaneously, I think that's very key. However, the IMF is not really structured to do that kind of thing, and the IMF is the vehicle right now, I think, that has the most leverage on um, Sri Lanka. Uh, and then finally, I just want to mention <clears throat> there is a continuing call to bring Sri Lanka before the ICC, the International Criminal Court. And it has come mainly from the Tamil diaspora, from victims and survivors uh, in the North and East of the country. It is hard to see how that will ever actually happen because Russia and China will crush it right away in the Security Council. But except for perhaps one maybe negative consequence, which, which might be that it gives people within the country maybe a false hope. I think it is not a bad idea to continue to make that call because it reminds the international community of the really serious nature of these abuses and the complete lack of accountability so far. Great, thank you, Miriam. Miriam, I wanted to pick up on some of your thoughts and, and put the question to Alan um, to elaborate a little bit possibly on uh, universal jurisdiction or other uh, means of accountability. You touched on, on the international referral uh, by the Security Council to the International Criminal Court. Alan, if we're thinking about ways of attaching accountability, attaching liability, universal jurisdiction, what is it? Um, and is it possibly applicable given the nature of the Tamil diaspora around the globe, or are there other ways that we should be creatively thinking about or that your civil society colleagues and, and friends have, have posited to you? Yeah, well, in principle, there's lots of avenues. In practice, there's not many, uh, but no, no need to not push for to expand the, the ladder. Um, <clears throat> so, I mean, there are you know, producing your universal jurisdiction cases, as you probably know better than I do, Paul, is very time consuming, expensive. It requires <clears throat> governments around the world uh, to put some, you know, real political will and muscle and resources into pursuing cases which might not, you know, succeed. Um, I think there have been, uh, I mean, one interesting thing is that there have been various Tamils prosecuted across the world um, for various, for engagement, you know, involvement with the LTTE or fundraising, or um, there have been cases in Germany, in France, in Australia, in Canada, um, but there has not been corresponding efforts by those same governments to, to track down or to find avenues to hold accountable um, Sri Lankan military or police or government officials who may have been involved in equally bad crimes. Um, so certainly there's there's um, that should happen. But I know there have been um, before the Roger before the Yahapalaniya, the good governance government came into power in 2015. I think there were some cases bubbling up in various European countries. There were efforts even in the U.S. To look into some crimes, possibly uh, some possible crimes that Gotabia might have been involved in. Um, those seem to then peter out a bit when the uh, government of Vikramasinghe and Sirisena said it was open to doing a hybrid court within Sri Lanka. Um, and a, a lot of Tamils actually warned people that if you go down this route in within Sri Lanka, you you believe the you believe what Ranil says, you'll end up being disappointed. And you know, there's a case to be said for that actually. Um, but um, I think you know there could be cases um, I th uh, that could be produced uh, um, in various countries, but it would require producing dossiers and tracking movements of people. And that is one thing possibly that the new UN 
um, accountability project, the OHCHR accountability project could contribute to. Um, that's one possible angle they could do. But one other thing I think that has been less thought about, but which is now should be at the top of people's lists, are uh, is um, um, pursuing cases of corruption. Uh, so there's lots of money believed to be stashed in various jurisdictions around the world by the Rajapaksas or people, you know, working for them, proxies or family members or cronies. And um, those are also hard cases to follow, but they are not impossible to if governments really put it, made it a priority. And I think in the wake of the Ukraine war and the um, outrage at Russia's actions and the desire, at, you know, the mo certain moves by Western governments to re rewrite laws and to put resources into tracking where Russian money went and into, you know, sanctioning Russian individuals, there's a there's more of an appetite for that kind of work. Um, uh, than there was a year ago. And so some of that appetite could possibly be, you know, could be transferred to Rajapaksas and Sri Lankan issues. And I think that would be uh, well worth it. Um, and it would also, I, you know, if if Western, if taxpayers all around the world, not just Western governments, are going to be funding a bailout of Sri Lanka, uh, it's fair enough to say to the same governments who are who are using that money that um, that there should be some real efforts to support structural change and to hold people accountable for where the previous money that they had has ended up. Thank you, Alan. Let, let me now turn to Ambika to pick up um, a question that was uh, put forward by our, our audience and partially answered uh, in the Q&A, but how does one begin to disentangle the, the military from the civil service. You know, there were so many individuals from the military that were appointed to civil service positions. Uh, somebody has mentioned that, you know, Raniel uh, Wickramasingham, his, his first act was to go over to the Ministry of Defense and have a chat with the military. And Jehan pointed out that his second act was to unleash them on the protesters uh, in, in the Peace Square. How does one disengage the military from, from the civilian government? And what other reforms are necessary in order to begin to move forward with transitional justice. Now, I, I remember from 20 minutes ago, you were giving it a, a zero probability of domestic transitional justice, but if we wanted to move in that direction, again, because it's all wrapped together, what are some of the prerequisite uh, institutional reforms that you would suggest? Uh, in terms of the military, we saw, um, you know, um, heightened militarization after the end of the war in Sri Lanka, ironic. And it's entrenched in many ways. It's not just the appointment of people, you know, former military officers to positions in the civilian government. It's also land takeover. It's various, it's a surveillance they undertake. It's the informal ways in which they engage with the community, with the public service uh, in the North and the East, et cetera. So it is not just one thing. I, th I think the first thing is to acknowledge that it's a problem. And now there is space to do that because of the military's high handedness in the South. The second thing is, of course, the military budget. Uh, um, right now, there are also problems with uh, cutting it down because if you, uh, you know, demobilize, then in the current economic climate, you'll have um, thousands of people out of a job. Uh, but of course, the military also, there are uh, reports of financial mismanagement, wastage, corruption, all of which need to be tackled. But it's not, the problem is also lack of oversight of the military. Now, these uh, reports of their financial mismanagement, et cetera, are in the public domain. They should be debated in parliament, but they are not. And one of the main problems uh, as obstacles to um, you know, downsizing the military demilitarization are the southern political parties because none of them want to touch this. They are too afraid to touch this because it goes back to their constituencies and they are afraid of the electoral impact. Uh, so it is something I think first what you need is a political will. And then it'll, it's going to be a long and painful process. You need the courage to do it. In terms of institutional reform, I think, um, good Lord, uh, we would need uh, independent institutions like the, um, the Human Rights Commission. For that, we need a change in the constitution to ensure that the process of appointment is independent. We need to ensure that the Attorney General's department is independent, that it is not advisor to the government as well as prosecutor. We need the police, which is violent, which is, you know, uh, 
um, corrupt, politicized, and which breaks the law rather than maintains it. We need um, uh, a huge <laughs> process of, I, I, I don't even want to go call it reform. I think that's uh, minimizing the problem. Uh, so I think it's multifaceted if you're talking about accountability, because these are the people who are going to be involved in the investigations, in the prosecutions. You can have foreign judges, but if you do not present a solid case, then what can the judges do? Great. Thank you, Ambika. Um, let's now turn to Jehan for the last word and talk to us about the future of Sri Lanka. Um, look into your crystal ball and tell us how you see this process of political and democratic transformation and transitional justice playing out in the coming months and in the coming years. And, and we're recorded, so two years from now, we're going <laughs> to replay this tape and, <laughs> and rate you on how well you did on this prediction. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic in the sense that I know that societies are very resilient. Sri Lanka is a resilient society. We have gone through very bad things, periods, and come out okay. And I've looked at other countries also, how they have come out of uh, total destruction very fast. But they must get the act together. And at the moment, I must, I'm really sorry to say that the situation looks very bleak in Sri Lanka because our, our political actors, our main political parties are not coming together. They are playing power games. They are thinking of themselves. I mean, it's a, when I'm, I'm sad to say when, when President uh, Rajapaksa, uh, sorry, uh, Anil Vikramasinghe was asked, uh, you are very close to uh, the Rajapaksas, aren't you? And then he said, uh, yes, uh, I'm, I'm not, Rajapaksas, they want to strengthen their party. I want to strengthen my party. That's not the way a leader should be. He, he should be thinking of his country, of the people's interests, and that is not there. So in that sense, we, we, we are facing a bleak future. Um, but as a result, the way the civil society has been talking, what we, what we want is that we want our uh, leaders to form an all-party government, not an all-party government where the majority in that government is the root, present ruling party, which has lost its mandate, but an all-party government in which all the different political parties have weight. And they should come together and they should come up with the policies that this country needs and try and get us out of the mess that we are in. And then in six months or within a year, they should go have an election. That is the way we see the future, a good future for ourselves. We have to push, for, we have to fight for that. And we need the international community to support us and to help us uh, both morally, politically, as well as financially. We really need, finan we need uh, outside financial help. We are a small country. So we don't need such a lot as maybe other countries need. I mean, billions are being spent in Ukraine. If we can get a little bit, I know Ukraine, terrible things are happening there. It's what should not be happening anywhere in the world is happening in Ukraine. And we are very sorry about that, but we, we also need a little bit of support. And uh, so that's, that's the future I see that we need your support. We need it. And we are glad, I'm glad that this conversation is taking place at this time. Thank you, Jehan. I really appreciate that, that sense of optimism. It's always nice to, after 58 minutes of accountability and, and doom and gloom, it's always nice to, to end on a, an optimistic note with a, with a fairly uh, prescriptive plan for, for how to move forward. Um, as, we, as we wrap up, I want to express my, my deep gratitude for uh, all of the panelists uh, joining and, and sharing your expertise, uh, and in particular, uh, for Alan giving up his late Friday afternoon, early Friday evening in beautiful London, I think, um, and for Ambika, Jehan, and Mario staying up to the wee hours of the morning to, uh, to dial in uh, and to participate. Miriam, you and I, it's, it's just our lunch hour, so <laughs> we still have our Friday afternoon chores to do uh, out in the yard after this call, so our day's not over. But thank you to, to our audience for, for, for joining. Unfortunately, that's all that we have time for today. We could be going on for, for still another hour. Um, the webinar is recorded uh, and will be made available to all of those who've registered for the, for the roundtable, uh, as well as released 
uh, on our uh, on our website and, and presumably on the various Twitters and LinkedIn's of, of our panelists. Uh, you know, this is part of the PILPG Thought Leadership Initiative series, uh, and I encourage you to uh, the uh, audience to follow um, the other events that we'll be doing over the summer and in the fall as part of our thought leadership. So thank you to all of our panelists and thank you to um, our over 200 uh, registrants. I hope you all have a wonderful what's left of your Friday evening and uh, weekend. Okay, thanks for having thank us. You. Thank, thank you, thank you very much. Thanks everyone. Thank you.